Good morning to all of you. The first uh, couple of things. Uh, one is uh, there are those of us who are speakers, but we recognize that many in the audience are qualified to be speakers on this subject. Everyone couldn't do that. And we also recognize that there are many people throughout the world who have already been taking a stand against uh, uh, brain death uh, and understanding of organ transplants. Uh, they uh, aren't, aren't here, but just know that we are here, we are blessed to be here, and that, that uh, there are others who could also uh, be here who are uh, authorities on the subject and could be here participating also, but everyone could not be uh, invited to, uh, to, to speak. The other thing that I, uh, uh, that I brought for, uh, for all of you uh, is a miraculous medal. And, and uh, some of you I know have them, especially the friars have them, uh, but any of the rest of you who would like one, I have one for you. Uh, and and uh, maybe you can get uh, uh, one of the cardinals or the bishops or the priests to uh, bless them for you. The, uh, uh, my presentation uh, will begin uh, with uh, uh, recordings from the television of several cases that have occurred uh, in recent time. I'm going to stop there for a I get to go home tomorrow. Simply amazing words from Raylene Cooperschmidt, who last month, a 65-year-old mother of two, suffered a brain hemorrhage so severe doctors told her family there was nothing modern medicine could possibly do to save her life. She had a, she had a very huge bleed, and, and she was essentially considered brain dead. Her grieving family followed her last wishes, removing life support, finalizing funeral arrangements, bringing her home to die. Yeah, they sure are, Deb. They are baffled, actually. Val Thomas suffered three heart attacks. She had no brain waves for 17 and a half hours and no heartbeat or pulse of her own for a long while. Only a respirator kept her breathing and rigor mortis actually set in. You really can't get more dead than that. But her family believes God had other plans. It's God's miracle. I'm very grateful and I, I give him all the praise awake and praising her Lord and Savior, Jesus, for breathing new life into her. Her hands were hard, her toes had, were hardened, and her, her toes were, were curling back. You know, death had set in. Death came for Val Thomas at 1.30 in the morning Saturday. Her heart stopped at home. Paramedics managed to revive her, but she didn't look right. Family members scrambled into action. They began praying and asking God for a miracle. It was probably close to 20 minutes, but definitely at least 15 that she had been with no oxygen, no pulse. Doctors put her on a special machine which induces hypothermia. The treatment involves lowering the body temperature for up to 24 hours before warming a patient for another 24. Even after we induced hypothermia in it, on her, that uh, her heart stopped again. In fact, Val's heart stopped a third time, making her odds of recovery almost nothing. And there was really no signs of uh, neurological uh, function. But loved ones didn't give up. They prayed in earnest, holding on to hope, and even had praise and worship right in the waiting room. I needed to know what to do. I had a, such a peace with us all praying in there. His mom's odds of surviving at less than 10 percent. Tim told the doctors to take her off life support, and everyone said goodbye. But a holdup about organ donations kept Val on a ventilator a little while longer. To God, just show me something. I know there's something here, and I didn't see it. Once the doctors did everything that they could, and the family members had made every decision they felt that they needed to, using the Word of God, and they finally gave Valerie up to Jesus, that's when they believed their miracle began. Zach Dunlap liked driving souped-up four-wheelers along with his friends until last November when he lost control and flipped. The prognosis couldn't have been worse. With no brain activity evident, Oklahoma authorities were notified that Zach had died. While his parents struggled to cope with the crushing news, they gave consent for Zach's organs to be donated. We wanted to make sure that, that some lucky person got to live on through Zach's heart.
with a helicopter sent by an organ harvesting team scheduled to land, Zach's relatives gathered to say their goodbyes, including his adoring grandmother. And I went in and I prayed right there. What were you asking for? Just a miracle. He was too young for God to take him. It was a time. Zach's cousins, Dan and Christy Coffin, who are both nurses, thought the same thing. And that's why Dan decided to run the shaft of his pocket knife across Zach's foot. He jerked his foot plumb out of my hand. Then Dan dug his fingernail beneath Zach's. That's a tender area. And Zach just threw his hand over here. And by now, this so kind of... he physically he moved physically that moved arm his hand over his body. Me, across his body. <gasps> and I kind of drew up inside myself, you know, and, and I'm like, oh my God. As for Zach's parents... We went from, from the lowest, the lowest possible low. moment to, oh my gosh, our, our alive. son is alive. I imagine you're still, though, not getting your hopes up right. because you don't really we were know very what he's going to be like. We had no idea what we were facing. But when could anyone be sure Zach could ever be more than a profoundly brain-damaged patient? That answer came in the following weeks and months. Zach would awake and then some. 48 days after the accident that nearly took his life, Zach came home to a hero's welcome. Yeah. And this morning, we're lucky enough to have Zach himself here along with his parents, Doug and Pam, and his younger sister, Casey. Good morning to you all. So great to see you all back here once again. Good morning. You. you are looking great. How are you feeling? I feel pretty good, but it's just hard. It seems like every time I see you that, you know, there's a look in your eyes, it's back, you've got that spark back, so you're really on the road to recovery here. Yeah, I just ain't got the patience. You just don't have the patience. You want yeah. to be better right away. Do you remember what happened leading up to the accident at any of the time right after? Well, I remember a little bit that was about an hour before the accident happened, mm -hmm. and then about six hours before that I remember. And I remember eating at the church after the parade. And that's nothing. about it. One thing that you told me that really, I, I had goosebumps after you told me this, was that the one thing you do remember, you, you seem to have some kind of out-of-body recollection almost, was that you heard the doctors pronounce you dead. You, you heard that, right? What was your reaction? What did you hear? I'm glad I couldn't get up and do what I wanted to do. You wanted to get up and shake them and say, I'm still in here, I'm alive? Uh, probably would have been a broken window they went out. <laughs> Four months. Well, that sets the stage for, uh, for the day. And uh, uh, instead of just telling you about those, uh, those cases, and those are just some of the ones that make it to television, and there are many others. And, and uh, the question, of course, is that if the transplanters had uh, gotten Zach's uh, beating heart, he would clearly be dead, and only because he had relatives who work in the intensive care unit is he able to uh, uh, respond on the television as we've seen him. How did I start to study this subject? This baby, Joseph, was the one who started my study. Uh, uh, Joseph uh, had flat brain waves uh, while he was still on the ventilator about five weeks after his delivery. Uh, we didn't take his organs. Uh, we didn't turn off his ventilator, even though his brain waves were interpreted as consistent with cerebral death. That's what was written on his chart. It did not make sense to me. Uh, so uh, we continued to treat him. This is Joseph when he's about seven. And uh, when Joseph went to school, he got straight A's, uh, uh, excellent grades. He ran track. He played baseball. Uh, this is Joseph as an adult and married, and uh, they uh, since have another child, so they have three children. This, this is uh, Brandon. Uh, Brandon's mother and father are here in the audience, and some of you might uh, have a chance to speak with them. But uh, uh, Brandon, a 16-year-old boy who had uh, 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 an injury to his brain, this is uh, Brandon and his mother and father and brother and sister. And uh, uh, about uh, six hours or so after his injury, he was declared brain dead. Uh, the family was told to go home. 
and later they found out about 20 hours later they actually uh, uh, cut out his uh, beating heart and other organs. And, and of course Brandon is missed greatly by his mother and father, but his sister has since married and, and has ch three children of her own and his uh, uh, brother is married, has a, a wife and three children. And so, and grandparents are in this picture, there's a ghost-like image of of uh, Brandon that, that you can see. So Brandon is greatly missed, uh, missed by his family, but really by all of us. Uh, many people uh, tend to think that these issues are somebody else's problem, but really it affects uh, uh, all of us either uh, immediately or eventually in some way. God creates uh, 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 each person each person is special and unique and made in the uh, image and likeness of God. Uh, when we uh, get on earth, we have a chance to uh, live our life, uh, do things uh, for ourselves and for, uh, for other uh, people. The uh, physician uh, uh, gifts, uh, gets to be a physician because of gifts and talents uh, from God, studies and is able to uh, uh, take care of patients. There's a standard of intrinsic worth uh, for the patient and what can a physician or a nurse or anyone in medicine do? We protect and preserve life and in modern times uh, we must also defend life and when we are doing this is what we are doing is uh, postponing death. Uh, the living human person the life is a reality. We can see the life. We can know the life in, in ourselves and in other people. Life is a gift. It's a continuum from uh, its conception to uh, its natural end. Life is in every cell, tissue, organ, and system. Uh, there are 11 systems in the body. Systems are, uh, uh, are putting together of cells, organs, and tissues to carry out particular functions. There are three major systems, major vital systems in the body, the circulatory system, the respiratory system, uh, and the central nervous system, but especially the, the brain. There's interdependence of organs and systems that, to maintain the unity. It's the unity of the body, but it's really the unity of the body and the soul. Uh, there's no one organ or system that controls all the other organs and, and systems. Uh, uh, when life is there, it's manifest, we can see it, uh, we can know it. God creates the person. Uh, Boethius defined the person uh, as an individual substance of a nature rational. Each of those words uh, has uh, significance. Uh, the soul, intellect, and will are concreated. Uh, at, at conception, the person is manifest. I think that's the proper way to, uh, to use that word. Each person is unique, unrepeatable. There's a unity of the soul and the body. Life on earth is a continuum uh, from its conception. Life has its ups and downs. It's not smooth, it's not easy at times. It's a continuum from conception until life ends. And there is a natural end to life, and after that, the word dead can be used. The uh, uh, death is a negative. It's an absence of life. It's the state of the body without life. In the remains, uh, there are words that we can use to describe what, we've, what is found. Dissolution, disintegration, destruction, and putrefaction. Yes, it does include non-functioning, but it's more than just a uh, non-functioning. What's left on earth is a dead body, a corpse, uh, the remains. It's empty. Empty is a good word to describe uh, what's there. The, someone who is dead, a corpse, the remains, a cadaver, a true cadaver, uh, is cold, is stiff, is unresponsive to all stimuli. There is no breathing. The ventilator can push air in, but does not and will not restore respiration. The difference is ventilation is movement of air. 
respiration is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide that takes place in the lungs and then via the circulation in all the tissues of the body. Uh, in a corpse, there is no heartbeat. There is no blood pressure. There is no pulse. Uh, there's a poor color. Uh, the nails and mucous membranes are pale or blue. There is no moving. Uh, there is cessation of vital body functions. The history of the modern culture of death began uh, in 1967 with the first heart transplant from South Africa. Many remember uh, Christian Bernard as the, uh, uh, as the doctor who did th that first heart transplant. Well, not to be outdone, the doctors in Brooklyn, New York, did a heart transplant three days later. Three days later, they cut the beating heart out of a three-day-old baby and transplanted it into an 18-day-old baby. That baby didn't live very long. We didn't hear much about, about that. But the, the, those heart transplants were clearly illegal and immoral and something had to be done to make them become legal. And they never do become moral, but something had to be done. So what was done? A committee was, uh, was appointed. Uh, where do you appoint such a committee? At the Harvard Medical School. And, and out of the Harvard committee came the first set of so-called brain death criteria known as the Harvard criteria. Uh, remember the first heart transplants in 1967? The report of the Harvard Committee was in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1968. And part of what that committee recommended was to make it legal. And they did make it legal already two years later. Kansas was the first state in the United States to get a brain death law. And it goes on from there with uh, other cases and eventually gets down to the uh, 2006 and the revised Uniform Anatomical Gift Act that I'll tell you some things uh, about and others will. Uh, brain death is not scientifically valid for true death. And e even for those who are not scientists can readily understand that, that there isn't any science if you uh, uh, don't make observations and check and recheck and the like. The Harvard criteria was, uh, was published without any patient data. There were no basic science studies, no studies on dogs or cats or, or, or other uh, uh, beasts. Uh, uh, there were no references uh, except for one reference, which was to Pope Pius XII. And they quoted Pope Pius XII out of context and didn't quote the entire thing. Pope Pius XII said, we are to presume that human life continues as long as vital functions are present, even when supported by artificial means. Uh, the, the next article in the literature, uh, uh, at least of significance, was three years later in 1971, known as the Minnesota Criteria. Think about this. Many people die. What did they do? They recorded brainwave testing on only nine patients. Four of the nine still had brainwave activity. Conclusion, no longer is it necessary and required to do brainwave testing before a declaration of death is made. There is no science to such a conclusion. The NIH criteria grew out of the collaborative study, which is the largest study in the literature. It's about 500 patients, but what happened to the 500 is that 44 of them did not die. And then what else? Those who did, did die, uh, 226, 10% had nothing wrong with the brain. And so there is no science at the beginning. They, they called their data and put it together and called it the NIH criteria, which was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1977. And in that article, the statement is made, these criteria are recommended for a larger clinical trial. 
It's been 30 years and it hasn't been done and it won't ever be done because uh, you can't make it any better and they already are getting uh, organs uh, for transplantation and that's what this uh, was all about. Uh, between 68 and 78, there were 30, more than 30 uh, different sets of criteria. Each set tends to become less strict than the previous set. Uh, the Harvard criteria in brain death is abbreviated in the literature these days as DBD, donation by brain death. They, they, the criteria became changed in several ways, but one you can readily understand. The Harvard criteria required 24 hours of observation. They shortened that time from 12 hours to six hours to three hours to one hour. And there's one set of, uh, of criteria in the literature that they take them off the vent ventilator for 30 to 60 seconds. And if there is no evidence of breathing, that's considered sufficient for the declaration of brain death. The Uniform Determination of Death Act, which is, uh, the, uh, tends to be the legal definition in the United States and throughout much of the world, it has either one or two uh, kinds of findings, uh, the cessation of, of circulation and respiration or the cessation of brain functions. So it's either one or two and it really could be both, and you can see if there's at least 30 different sets, and there's more than that, but if you just take 30, you can see that in the Uniform Determination of Death Act, there's 33 different ways to be declared, brain, uh, to be declared dead so they can get your organs. The, uh, the things have evolved to what's known as DCD, donation by cardiac death, what happens in those patients is they are not brain dead at all by anybody's criteria. But what they do is go to the relatives to get a do not resuscitate order, a DNR. And then they take them off the ventilator and they wait till they're without a pulse. Not until the heart stops, not until the heart stops. The heart's still beating. They wait until there's not a pulse that they don't, require, uh, don't record a pulse. How long do they wait? They have shortened that time down to as short as 75 seconds, 1.25 minutes in two babies in Colorado, where they took them off the ventilator and then uh, for, and after 75 seconds uh, proceeded to uh, cut out the, uh, uh, the heart and transplant it to someone else. There's no clearly determined parameters commonly held by the international scientific community. There's no consensus in the criteria uh, as reported as recently in Neurology, January 2008. Uh, brainwave testing is not required. Uh, uh, it's the action that is taken that results in true death. The action of cutting out the organs is what causes the death. The action, if they turn off the life support and they can't uh, survive on their own, that, that's what causes the true death. Uh, patients declared uh, brain dead can live for an extended period of time, especially if they don't do the uh, the apnea test, and you will hear more about that later on today. The longest surviving patient that I have seen and, and uh, was TK, was reported by uh, Dr. Alan Schumann, but TK was a patient that, that I myself saw at the age of four with a declaration of brain death and participating in his treatment and care. His mother would not agree to having his organs taken out and so he continued to get, uh, get treatment and continued to live. He lived almost 20 years after the declaration of brain death. Uh, and why did he live that long? Because no one cut out his beating heart. The, you must separate issues between tissues and organs. Tissues can be obtained after true death. Uh, skin, bones, corneas, veins, heart valves, and connective tissues. Organs like heart, lungs, kidneys, liver, pancreas, and intestines uh, come from someone who is not truly dead, uh, uh, but they're declared uh, brain dead, and then more recently they go into uh, donation by, by cardiac death. 
the, uh, uh, to help us all understand, I'm going to try to show you a little uh, analogy uh, that will help. But we, we go to Ephesians to understand we are God's work, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good work which God prepared for us to do. We are always God's work of art. Now, those, especially here in Rome, recognize the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, uh, uh, beautiful by, by uh, Michelangelo, Michelangelo's uh, work of art, and we appreciate that. Uh, uh, over the years, several times, it has become soiled and needed to be cleaned. This is what it was most recently and needed to be cleaned, and it was cleaned meticulously and carefully to preserve the, uh, the workmanship, the creation of art by Michelangelo. And if we uh, uh, look here at this uh, fresco, the creation of Adam, and look, up, uh, look at it more closely before it was restored, we can see that the clouds are not clear. We can see cracks. Well, how, how do we restore that? Well, supposing that what we did was transplanted into Michelangelo's work of art, uh, uh, something to just replace the clouds. Well, where could we look to find that? Well, right outside uh, of the Sistine Chapel is, uh, we can find Raphael's School of Athens. And if we look closely at that, at that, that school, we can, we can see uh, 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 Plato uh, and Aristotle, and here uh, uh, are, are the clouds uh, that are in that fresco. Well, let's just transplant those clouds and look how nicely they, they uh, look in Michelangelo's. But who would do that? Who would do that to the work of art of Raphael or our Michelangelo's uh, work of art. And look what we'd have left after we cut out. Uh, uh, we would have this left in, in, in Raphael's uh, creation, created work of art. And here's a, 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 another one, a triangular shape. Uh, and before it was restored, uh, it was dirty and soiled. Well, let's just get a transplant and where could we go to get a transplant, well, let's just look again right outside the Sistine Chapel, and there's uh, Jateau's uh, St. Francis and St. Clair. Well, this looks pretty nice. Let's just get part of that and transplant that into Michelangelo's uh, work of art. Uh, and what would we have left? Look what we did to uh, uh, the uh, fresco of St. Clair. So one can see what this is all about in terms of transplanting parts of one into parts of another. And I try to use these analogies because we come together and some of us have backgrounds in theology, some in medicine, some in law, some without study in any of them, and yet it's all the same. We are all created in the image and likeness of God. And when a part is defective, uh, do we solve the problem by going out and transplanting uh, other parts? And, and what are we doing when we're uh, doing that? Uh, remember, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God uh, prepared for us to do. We are always God's work of art. Now, I want to make brief mention about the uniform anatomical uh, Gift Act, which is revised in 2006. What this act does is make that everyone uh, is, and it's already been passed in 36 of the 50 states in the United States, but it makes everyone that they presume that they intend to, to give their organs. It's presumed consent for measures necessary to ensure suitability. And this is done to living persons, living patients, uh, no longer do you have to be of sound mind to sign up to be an organ donor. Uh, it lacks full and informed uh, consent. It trumps advanced directives uh, uh, that someone might advance, and they get resuscitated anyway. 
It changes the requirement from after death to near death. Remember, when someone is near death, they're clearly living. The, and, and other things, uh, presume content, consent for all measures necessary to ensure suitability for organ transplantation. Uh, uh, when, you, when you do this, it's involuntary servitude. Involuntary servitude is slavery. Uh, it's slavery is what has occurred. Now, it isn't just in the United States, but it's uh, uh, in many places in the world. I've found at least 20 countries that already have uh, presumed consent, including these, Austria, Belgium, Nor Denmark, Finland, France, Italy, Norway, Spain, Sweden, and, and many others. Uh, a person is alive until dead. An unconscious person in an intensive care unit on a, vi on a ventilator with absence of some tested brain functioning, but many other signs of life is living. We can protect, preserve, and defend that life. Brain death was devised, concocted, and conjured to get organs. You can compare living persons and brain dead and truly dead and see that living persons and brain dead have beating hearts. They're well perfused, they're warm, they're on a ventilator and they have respiration. They grow, uh, the body can grow as, as uh, TK grew from a four-year-old boy up to the size of an adult. Uh, hair can grow, healing can go on. Incidentally, after true death, there is no growth of hair. Even in modern writings, I see people write that. It's not true. After true death, there is no growth of hair. Early in my studies, I checked that out in multiple ways. Uh, uh, cooling is very interesting because uh, in the living person, in the brain dead person, cooling slows metabolism. Uh, and after death in the remains, cooling slows disintegration. It's the same cooling, but it has two different effects. In the living, it slows metabolism. In the dead, it slows disintegration. The consent is necessary in all of this. It has to be full and explicit consent in order to consent or decline in a free and conscientious manner. Everyone must be properly informed. The question then, can organ transplantation protect life to its natural end? One has to know that to take organs from someone with a beating heart, normal blood pressure, normal color, and normal temperature, that causes true death, and one cannot participate in that. A person is living and not dead even an instant before true death. Donation must not impose death or weaken the donor. The Catholic Catechism is very clear. It says that, that organ transplanta transplantation cannot, cannot cause death or debilitating mutilation. Uh, everyone must be fully and explicitly informed. That means donors and recipients. The test to declare uh, death must not hasten or cause death and you will hear about the apnea test as the day goes on. The only uh, uh, protection uh, against all this is to document refusal in some way. When there's still doubt about death, excision of an unpaired vital organ is prohibited. It's, it's cannibalism to cut out the organs, to cut out the sky from Raphael and transplant it into the work of Michelangelo would be cannibalism. Who would stand for cannibalism of just art? And we're talking about God's workmanship when we talk about the, uh, the living person. To devise a fiction for the declaration of death is not ethically acceptable and is morally wrong. It is slavery to do that. To cut out an unpaired vital organ, a heart or a whole liver before death does not respect the dignity and value of the human person. Though donation must be truly dead with certainty. Cessation of brain function laws followed by living will laws are all part of or lead to imposed death. And the correct Greek word for that is epivalothanasia. 
Uh, the word euthanasia is commonly used, but that's not a correct word. As many of you know, the EU means good and thanasia means death. And the correct Greek word, if we wanted to use a Greek word, would be epivalothanasia, epi from the outside, valo to thrust upon, and thanasia means death, imposed death. Death ought not be declared unless the circulatory and respiratory systems and the entire brain have been destroyed. And I'll just quickly tell you that, that what, what uh, we have pr proposed is a recommended statute that says no one shall be declared dead unless the respiratory and circulatory systems and the entire brain have been destroyed. And such destruction uh, shall be determined in accord with universally accepted medical standards. This is solidly based medically, ethically, and religiously, and unexceptionable. And, and then what can you do to protect yourself? Uh, uh, there's a medical card that we have put together, and you can get that here. It says, I wish to live the lifespan given to me by God. I direct my treatments and care, including nutrition and hydration, however administered, be given to protect and preserve my life. Do not hasten my death. Do not do an apnea test. Do not take any organ for transplantation or any other purpose. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your attention.